clearly and concisely. And once you learn how to do that, then you can bring in all the stakeholders and you can get into programs that'll help you and train you on how to build it. But that first step is you have to design a business model that is desirable. When I initially moved back to Pensacola, I had a meeting with Lloyd. Lloyd invited me for breakfast and I was telling him, man, I still have an idea for the entertainment industry. This is what I wanted to do. He was like, all right, I got started up on the blocks. So you, I need you to start coming to Startup on the Blocks and get a little more information on how to work through the tech ecosystem and uh, take your idea and we'll get you where you need to go. My company is called The Know is an app that is streamlining business for the entertainment industry. Yeah, so if you're a musician, what you would do is pretty much jump on the platform, you'll create a profile, but the way we created the profile is pretty much a cleaner way. So now if they want more information about you, You'll connect your social media platforms, your streaming platforms, and that way they can go directly to it. What we also have included is your calendar. So pretty much you can set your days, you can set your price for your days and automate your booking. So initially talking to Lloyd, my idea was all here, it was there, it was over here, it was over there. It was like, all right, Quinn, I get it. <laughs> you got a lot that you want to do, but we need you to bring it in just a little bit and then work on your pitch, your story, and how you're going to bring it full circle to get people to understand what you're trying to create. Most of the programs here wasn't inclusive. And so we said we'll focus on helping founders of color. We also start at the beginning of the thing, at the idea stage, whereas a lot of the programs you see here locally, they start after you're up and, and though that's not very efficient. Unless you have, if you don't have a lot of money, you can't recover from your mistakes. And the Lean Startup System, it actually helps you make mistakes faster before you spend a lot of money. You don't actually start building anything until you got customer buy-in. There was a need for small businesses to bring brand awareness to their business. I see there's a lot of makers and bakers that they're making all of these goodies and these products, but they can't market it, they can't sell it at the same time, and there needs to be kind of that middle man, that middle person to help bring economic growth to some of the small businesses in Pensacola. So Taste of Pensacola, I came up with that idea during the pandemic when I saw things at that time that Amazon wasn't, couldn't fulfill. They didn't even have those products, but the local people in the community, they did. And so there was a ton of people coming out saying, hey, I make masks. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. All the local people here that are just as talented that can actually make those products. And so I wanted to kind of showcase who they were. So with Taste of Pensacola, our income streams, we have several of them. We have the corporate America. We do corporate gifting, just regular consumers, different Pensacola natives that don't live here that want to purchase our boxes, like a Taste of Weddings distribution. So we also do bulk sales. So for a private airline, if they want some local snacks and goodies on their passenger flights, they will come to Taste of Pensacola and we will source their vendors here locally. And we'll give a small business owner an opportunity to have reoccurring monthly sales. I've always had a really big vision for Taste of Pensacola. I knew that it could go beyond just local. I know that maybe other communities could possibly use the same platform that I'm trying to build. And I always have these big visions, but I never know how to even get there. Where do I start? I know it's more than, there's a lot of technical things behind it. I know there's a lot of research, but that connection, I never had it until thankfully you know, I met and was introduced to Startups on the Blocks and was able to just learn more about how to grow it in terms of data. Things I just never thought about, dip framework, words like traction. Huh? There's a lot of things that I just did not know about and, and language that I need to know in order to get funding for my business. There's just a lot that I didn't know. I would go to the stores and look online. They didn't have a wide variety of natural hair products about eight years ago. And the ones that they did have, the ingredients, it would say that they were all natural. And when I would research the ingredients, a lot of the ingredients were not natural. I make everything, my shampoo, conditioner, I have an oil that I make, and I have two different separate butters. Like I had some people who were completely bald and grew their hair. Just, it's about giving women their confidence back in their hair. I have this salon and I have a second salon and I have my products in about five beauty supply stores. So I need a manufacturer to keep up with the demand at this point. Start Off on the Blocks has helped my business grow. Send me to different people. I'm able to do different pitch competitions to apply for grants in the community for small businesses.
Lloyd's a really good person to connect with. He has a lot of resources here in the community that can help small businesses grow. If you have a product out there and you're trying to go big time, he's the person that you would want to meet with. So it's really important to have some type of support because nine times out of 10, most founders start out on their own. And to have somebody that has an idea of how the ecosystem works and is able to tap into other resources and bring back to the community, and that pretty much has encountered some of the roadblocks or going through the same roadblocks that we're currently going through and understands where you're at, your culture and how you respond to things is a big help because you don't really have too many people to have access to what we have access to here in the community. And a lot of people believe that you have to leave and go to bigger cities to do the things that we're doing here. But I mean, it's one thing to have exposure, but you have to actually know it's here in the community in order to take advantage of the resources. So I get approached and I talk to friends all the time that wants to either start an idea or hear that I'm actually doing the app and wants to know more information about how are you doing it or what's the process, what's the path. I'm like, man, we have somebody here, start up on the blocks, Laura Richard. And Lloyd is here, he's a great resource to the community and to founders that's trying to learn the ecosystem. So join, start up on the blocks. Hello, hello. How's everybody doing out there in Startup on the Blocks land? Hello, Jim. How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you? Yeah, welcome to Startup on the Blocks. We really appreciate you coming on to, to kind of share some of your journey and some of your ups and downs and insights and all that good stuff. Glad to have you here. Glad to be here. All righty. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank our sponsors uh, that support our program and um, we actually um, got a new sponsor this week, and I'll, I'll get their logo up um, for uh, for the next event. Um, so you're familiar with um, Blacks in Technology, right? That I am. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so we, we signed an agreement with them this this week, and and so we're going to be um, uh, they're going to be supporting us up on the box program and making um, the training available to the. Uh, so the, the the blacks and technology members so Great. yeah so that i think that's that'll be a, a good deal to to kind of expand out a little bit and, and, and let, help more people take advantage of the the, the training platforms that provide the founders a, a, a really good, good foundation so you've been um involved with blacks and technology yeah um it's kind of a a, a recent move <laughs> okay. but, uh, yeah i i uh met carmen and um you know like uh started to have conversations about what they're trying to do and there was just a lot of alignment oh. and um, you know okay. trying to understand like where they currently are where they want to be and what we feel as though that the ecosystem needs and um yeah i'm it's just fantastic, fantastic I've been here trying to do my part <laughs> well, you, you're you're on, and so you're definitely um, helping, and uh, we we sure surely uh, uh, appreciate that. And so definitely got a lot of good opportunities uh, uh, for for founders out there. Yes, uh, so let's keep the ball rolling here. So um, so you're our guest tonight, and we got a few more coming up. So I I let you go ahead and and kind of introduce yourself and just a little short introduction here. All right. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Jim. I am I'm reading off the slide. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Meter Feeder. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was okay. Startup of the Box, January 19th. Started, just joking. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I'm yeah. Sorry. yeah we're, we're definitely glad to hear you and, we, and we'll get more into your story uh, here in a little bit. Um, sure. uh, uh, next week, we got Rizala Carrington. Uh, she's the ball of fire. <laughs> yeah, I met her going through the uh, Startup Science um, two-week pre-accelerator. And so, yeah, she's she's been involved in a lot of startups. And I think she's working with Techstars at, at, as well right now. So that that's kind of good. And then uh, next month, we're going to have um, another a female founder and she'll she'll share some of her, her stories as well all right all righty so so would you agree that the number one thing that the founder has to do is get their mindset right oh man but i mean that's the hardest thing yes 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so what what I uh, what we do with Startup on the Block, we try to, you know, uh, you know, let people founders know or people who want to be founders know. You know, one of the key steps is getting the, the um, getting your the mindset of a founder, and um, and and then you have to learn the skills and best practices for being a founder. And if you do that, you can take advantage of all the opportunities that are in the ecosystem. And there are a lot of opportunities out there in the ecosystem. So that that's kind of the uh, the key to unlocking those those things. And for me, the logic behind that is, you know, like. Um, uh, black small business, black startups. We we start out with way less funding than than our counterparts, and so we we need to leverage some of these things in the ecosystem to kind of help 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 grow. And you know, later on, I hope you share some of your stories about how you leverage the ecosystem to kind of help help out with meter fever. And so we'll first off, you know, talk about the the the, the journey of a founder. And, and so I'll show three different little kind of like roadmap things here. And it starts way before you actually launch your product or service. And, and so that's one of the key things. And you have to go through these phases in, 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 um, in order to keep moving forward. And so um, the startup science thing, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with it at all. Yeah. So the deal, the deal here, uh, Jim, um, they're, they're, um, the founders of this uh, company and in, in, in this training program, they've been through like 14 exits, major exits. So they so they decided to to come come back and create a training program to teach you the best practices for for starting from a, a vision all the way to an exit and and all those things how you you know get prepared for accelerator programs how you speak to investors connecting you with investors and so to me this is a godsend um, for for us because it, it actually provides all the the tactics that a founder needs to know how to communicate with investors okay. yeah and um so our, uh, our main training program is we use the lean stack platform and i think this this particular uh approach illustrates the uh, uh an approach and, and one of the best methodologies for once you have an idea, how to work with that idea to kind of get it to, to something uh, useful. And so first off, it's all about um, getting that foundation, that mindset, and, and then designing a scalable business model. Did any of your training, did they, anybody say, well, we're gonna teach you how to design a business model that's scalable? No, it's it literally started with do things that don't scale. Okay. Okay. Right? And and that's what I did. Right. It's like, I, I mean, I was writing, well, yeah, I was essentially walking door to door okay. <laughs> and when okay. I learned something, I went home and wrote some software. Right. So okay. Okay. Uh, I was definitely doing things that didn't scale. And I, and I knew that I was doing it until yeah, I was yeah. able to find the right, uh, the, the right concoction that I needed. Yes, yes, yeah, and and so the idea with this um, this business model design and foundation thing is the idea is um, you, the objective for that is to so you can learn how to pitch how you make money with your idea uh, clearly and concisely, and and so once you can do that, you can actually recruit co co founders. You can get in the program, but you have to be able to communicate how you make money with your with your idea clearly clearly and, and and concisely and then you go through this um, next phase which is like a 90-day cycle and that's that's where you um uh, do a lot more interaction with customers and and take advantage of uh, some more tools and you actually uh, design a solution for you for uh, that you're using your business model uh, based on interacting with these customers through, through these force uh, customer forces tools and then you pick what's common about that and you actually uh, design a solution based on that so you're getting customer buy buy in for the solution you're designing before you actually start building it and so and so the idea is with all the cloud technology and all the technology that's available now you can potentially build an mvp in a couple of months you know it, it doesn't really 
take that long to get an, an, an MVP out there for somebody to use. And, and so in every startup is trying to get to the, uh, this uh, knee in the curve where you get that, uh, that uh, product market fit. And so, cause that's when you're, that's when you take advantage of that 10 X, uh, that 10 X scaling. And so, um, but the problem, what we see is mo most founders, they don't follow a methodology. And so they, they're out there trying to figure out what to do. And the bad news is they may run out of money before they get to that product market fit. And so what, what the lean stack program tries to do is try to, you know, you do, do it lean and follow the best practice. So, you, so you can, so you can make it to this uh, product market market fit. And so it is complicated, you like to say, but once you, you know, follow the methodology, you can, you can actually find a plan that works in, with that product market fit. And so that, does that make sense to you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so that, that's all we're trying to do is help people get to, get to that point. And, and so, um, and it's not definitely not, not easy. This is our playbook before we had any of the training programs. We, you know, we just told people to go to these websites and you can learn, learn, learn how to do some of the stuff. And, and so that's, that's what we did here. And so, um, uh, Kukur Institute, the start from the blocks, we, we try to take the founders where they are. And we also talk to main street businesses to, to see if they have some ideas on, 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 uh, that they can build a solution for and turn it into a scalable product. And so we, we, we kind of do these things here in the middle and try to connect people with all these programs that are, that are out here on, on, on the end. And, uh, by, by the way, uh, this week, um, there was another pitch competition announced for a hundred thousand dollars here in Florida. And, and so, <laughs> and so, so like they, uh, we're, we're participating in an event called uh, Synapse Florida. Have you had you heard of that? No, no. So so it's like a one day uh, startup con conference, and they they have a you know I think this year they're expecting a little over uh, seven thousand people, and that that's actually big for for Tampa, Florida. You know you know yeah. there. But um, anyway, they got um, they, uh, Florida Power and Light had already sponsored a a, a um, a seventy-five thousand dollar pitch competition, mm -hmm. and, and so the applications for that had closed. And then all of a sudden, got an email this week. Somebody else stepped in and and, and created another pitch competition for a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. And you can you have until like February seventh to apply for that. Mm -hmm. so, so that's to me that shows that that the ecosystem really wants to help people. And right. that, that hundred thousand dollar one, they're gonna actually train you how to pitch before you get up there and pitch your idea. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I mean that's that's one of the things that I'm really yeah, like as far as uh pitch competition is concerned, you can say that I'm not one of the, the greatest fans of pitch competitions mm -hmm. because yeah. I'm like entrepreneurs should be working on their business, not yeah. entertaining rich folks. So, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad that, you know, because whenever someone's like, oh, I'm, I'm throwing a pitch competition, I was like, if you want to help, just give them the help. Yeah. yeah so yeah. when you're saying they're actually just going and, and helping them, you know, with the pitch and things on those lines. Yeah, that's great. And it just so happens that someone might win a whole bunch of money. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. And, and so like it, it, it is uh, we definitely have some founders that are that don't like the, the, the pitch and, and don't want to pitch. And, and, and so I, I think that's fine. You know, if you got the resources you need to, to kind of move forward. But if you don't have all the resources you need to move forward and, and you could use a, a little extra extra cash and, and exposure uh, and and it just is it just. It, it's, it's a challenge. It's no easy way because you have to be known uh, uh, most of the time to actually win these pitch competitions. So yeah. Said, yeah. Yeah. So I if, mean, you, if you're not I, known. I yeah. get it. I get it. I've done my fair share of pitch competitions. Yes. And uh, there's actually a few, like, I guess my, my, my thought process started changing when I was like, I remember losing a pitch competition. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, good. 
right? It's like I wanted someone else to win. And when I lost and they won, I was like, they should have just gotten the help to begin with. Like, there's no reason for this pitch competition. Like, mm-hmm. they should have been, you know, yeah. in the position so that we can we can all gather around one another and lift each yes. other up. So, um, yeah. yeah, I I fully agree. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, I'm just like really hoping that uh, 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 the people who come in second, third, fourth, and fifth get the the support that they need as well right, right, rather yeah. than just the person who gets it first yeah and, and I, I will say <clears throat> if i if i look back at all the pitch competitions i participated in um I, I would actually say the first um two i participated in they they had like three or four months of training before the pitch competition and mentors to help you get prepared yeah so that so i, I did have good experience you know, and, and actually um, most most of them like that. And, and that's the way it should be designed where where you like. So also in Florida, in, um, they have the Emerge of America's conference. And what they do, if you get selected for their competition, they they actually have like a six week boot camp up to that to kind of get you ready. And so, yeah, that's, yeah. That's so what, I, I would like to do a little bit of a juxtaposition mm-hmm. about what we do. Okay, like, good. Like entertainment mm-hmm. and what like other communities do. Yes. <laughs> right. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, we went through a, a uh, uh, an accelerator called Y Combinator. Yes, and, that's and, the um, biggest, biggest one. <laughs> I mean, some people know, some people don't. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> they, also, like, they went to a $500,000, you know, see, you know, funding. So hey, that's, that's pretty big. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you compare the two, right. So, mm-hmm. If I'm going and I'm like getting help in order to go pitch and so on and yeah. so forth, like I get it, I appreciate that. That is yeah. absolutely necessary. I'm a software developer. Yeah. I need to learn how to speak English. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if, if the difference is I'm going with into a pitch competition and I might get something, I might not get something, you mm-hmm. know, whatever. Y Combinator, they fill the room yeah. with hundreds okay. of investors, and yeah. you're not allowed in the room unless you're known for writing checks. Yes. Okay. That's, that's so, a sweet position to be in. Exactly. Look at the difference. <laughs> yeah. Look at the difference. Like one person might walk out of the room with, you know, a couple bucks in their pocket. Yeah. And then other people are getting literal millions of dollars. Yeah. Right. And it's a bunch of people. It's, you know, so it's like, you know, when I see my friend on stage and he's pitching, I'm not sitting there hoping that he flubs his lines so that I can like give my one liner and then walk away with a couple bucks. Whereas yeah. on the other side, you know, I'm, I'm like rooting for him. I like really yeah. want his, his business to do well or her business yeah. to do well. Yeah. And, you know, impress the investors and walk away with, you know, yeah a war chest <laughs> so that they can go and you know feed their families and hire people and you know become mm-hmm. a, a staple in their community yeah and i and and <clears throat> we'll we'll get back to y combinator and, and and you know after we talk about you know get into the your drama because i you you definitely need to share your experience on you know applying for y combinator and 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 um and, and what a difference it, it made in your your startup startup journey, and for the audience, um, the Y Combinator they also do this thing called StartupSchool.com.org, and they have the free training on there to to kind of get you prepared, you know, to you know if, if you can't get in the accelerator uh, program. So that's a really good. And so, it, um, <laughs> my I guess one of that one of our uh, playbook points is, you know, do, you know, the startup school training because it literally, you know, teaches you what to expect and it ha- they have all the resources there to kind of move you forward. So it's actually uh, a really, really good thing. And it's, 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 a, it's I, I, I'm definitely excited about it. And, and I, I love to, to meet people that have um, been through that Y Combinator and they, they set a really good example and but they but what I heard was they actually open 
they kind of like open source being a founder. Yeah. 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 I mean, and, and that's the thing. Yeah. It's like all the things that they, you know, you would see as being secret. Like mm -hmm. they literally tell you all the things like in public that they do in private. Like it's, I mean, yeah. granted you do get it, get like one-on-one -on -one time with uh, some really great folks, yeah. but um, yeah, like a lot of the things that you learn at Y Combinator, they're mm -hmm. really just saying, you know, essentially the same thing. Right. That, gotcha. That, gotcha. That, that's else. exactly right. So uh, we we want to kind of give you a, a, a minute, just a, a couple of minutes to kind of talk about how, you know, like from a young guy, you know, high school, or whatever, and your, your journey and kind of what led you to to this, you know, doing in media fear. And if you want to tell tell people a little bit about media fear first, so people okay, kind of see what the, where, how you got there sure um well I'll, okay how about i start with who i am where i came from yeah okay <laughs> then work my way through okay uh, good. Not, not quite, yeah I'll, I'll go through the last 40 years like really quickly okay uh, <laughs> um so i started writing software um like back in the early 80s and um after watching it i saw a movie called tron and i was <laughs> like i want to do that what did they do and my mom was like he was a computer scientist. I was like, computer, like science, like chemicals. They were like, no, computer science. So she okay. got me in like super early. And my mom and dad came together. They scraped their pennies together and they sent me to, to New York Tech to go wow. to like programming camp. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Like fast forward into the 90s, everyone was trying to find themselves. So uh, I ended up uh, uh, leaving software for a little bit and then started getting into high energy physics and uh they told me like don't get into high energy don't go into science because you'll be begging for money for your rest of your life so uh i ended up becoming an entrepreneur I'm begging oh. for money for the, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean after that i decided to go into medicine realized i didn't like really like sick people got back into mm -hmm. computer science okay. uh, went to Carnegie Mellon university studied artificial intelligence I mean, there were amazing people, like professors like Herb Simon, the godfather of artificial intelligence and people like mm -hmm. that, like going mm -hmm. there at that time, right? Um, fast forward uh, a couple of years, you know, I mean, I, I'd say like 97, I, I uh, got a job uh, writing software um, and they actually, like my boss took me out to lunch and uh, he actually sent me um to uh you know we, we looked in the sky we see a, a helicopter like one of those nice fancy helicopters yeah mm -hmm. and he was like i bet you any amount of money that that is not a software developer out there right and that's the point where i was like oh i'm not going to get really really rich as a software developer i need to be an entrepreneur right okay gotcha yeah so i ended up building all sorts of things like uh there was this thing called pghlife.com where it's like it was a search engine like Lycos or Google, but instead of searching for websites, you search for things. Okay. Like okay. Right? Uh, we also did, um, I, I built a, a product where it was uh, a cell phone, like one of those big cell phone bricks. But okay. It's like you would scan uh, a QR code and your doctor would be able to put a diet on your phone. You get a red light if you're allowed to eat it, a green light if you're not allowed <laughs> to eat it, you know. And, you know, investors, they didn't want to touch it. They were like, who's going to use the internet on their phone? And, you know, okay. it was the mess, right? Uh -huh. So um, the, the, we, I, I decided to like, you know, just essentially just buckle down and nine to five job, you know, build a medical software, uh, you know, doing all the things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, American Eagle Outfitters, I was, you know, doing, in, in, quote unquote important things right okay. mm -hmm. so then suddenly uh my co-founder and i which we started writing software together like in 2000 so it's been like 23 years wow, now. wow. that's pretty amazing yeah mm -hmm. so that that's a lesson like yes. we did not meet each other in in a, a speed dating situation okay <laughs> you know so like when when we uh 
when he wants to wring my neck, he realizes that he loves my wife and children, right? So okay. <laughs> it's like we're here to make each other rich, not to like, you know, win an argument. Okay. Um, but yeah, so uh, before we started Meter Fee, we built a platform that handled about 30% of all the mobile retail sales in the US. Wow, so that's pretty big. You bought three things off your cell phone. You probably touched my code before. <laughs> okay. So with that being said, we started Meter Feeder. Meter Feeder, in its current incantation, is uh, uh, a way for internet connected devices to pay for parking. Okay. Um, so the first thing that everybody says is, oh, well, I have an app where I can pay for parking. Well, that's cute. It's not 2007 anymore. There are other internet connected devices like your car, yeah. right? So uh, we actually um, started working with fleets so that fleet vehicles can turn their vehicles off and automatically pay for parking. Wow, that's pretty uh, we decided to not mm -hmm. there. And when you turn your vehicle on, you actually can search, see if you got a parking ticket. Okay. <laughs> so we're we're really trying to keep everybody compliant at this point. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so that that's uh um so so what led you to the fleet approach, you know, to um as a kind of go to market type that's of that's a great question. So <laughs> <laughs> man all right so COVID happened right? okay i'm in pittsburgh pennsylvania 13 mm percent -hmm. of pittsburgh's annual budget is parking taxes wow <laughs> not parking payment that parking payment is parking taxes right wow. 95 percent of their parking revenue disappeared overnight okay gotcha so now what right so 13 percent and that's that's taking 13 percent out of your your budget yep so mm -hmm. i i realize like you know everybody's a little bit desperate right now i don't mm -hmm. know like so i literally just started calling different people mm -hmm. like uh, uh parking authorities across the united states mm -hmm. and i'm like look i realize that you're going through a hard time and i literally have nothing to sell you Mm -hmm. I just have a couple questions, right? So I'm like, what are you currently doing? You know, like, are you like laying people off? Are you, you know, like, just like, and people were just telling me like all the stuff that they were doing, right? Mm -hmm. So I would get in contact with, uh, you know, the, there was uh, Pasadena, California. There was, the, the, the guy was brilliant, right? He was like, I don't want to lay off my parking enforcement officers. So I'm, I'm sending them to be couriers for COVID tests. Okay. Right? So he's getting money for that so he can keep on paying his people. Okay. So then it's like suddenly I would get like tips like that and I mm -hmm. would start telling other people about it and they're like, ah, oh, I could do that too. I'm like, yeah, you <laughs> can. Right. So mm -hmm. it's like everyone was getting me like tips and tricks and stuff like that. Yeah. And I was sort of just helping. Okay. But then I started realizing everybody's mere mortals like you and me are staying home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But the curves are still being used, except it's just being used by people who have trillion dollar market caps. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. So the least I can do is a help them continue to get parking revenue. Okay. And B, what a lot of people don't realize is on the books, like I'd say about only 60 to 70 percent of all parking tickets get paid. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm like let's just make it easier to pay for parking tickets, yeah that's, that's right a, <laughs> and then yeah. suddenly it yeah it's like it, it just really hit a nerve where they were like we need to prepare right i mean just multiple things right next time COVID happens like like they need to continue to, to generate capital yeah in addition you know what happens when autonomous vehicles are here mm -hmm. right i gotta put a quarter of the meter if there's no one in the car to put a quarter of the meter that's right, right. So, that's right. Uh, being able to uh, move in that fleet direction mm -hmm. was, was, was essentially a game changer for us. And it helped yeah. us stand out in the market. Yeah. So like, it, it sounds like you live based on what you said, it sounds like you got the idea as a result of COVID. Yeah. COVID did a lot of bad things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, COVID, COVID did a lot of bad things. I wish it was never here. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would, you know, overall, uh, it, it was not a net positive for the world. Right. However, you know, um, 
you know, living in the in in the real world, I, I appreciate what it's turned into, and uh, you know what we were able to to glean from it. Right? Yeah. I, I am in no way happy that it happened, right. <laughs> but I am happy that yeah. uh, I do have a way for to provide for my wife and kids now. Yeah. So, like, uh, I want to kind of like take a little, uh, you know, kind of information thing here. So, so you just pointed out kind of COVID kind of force you into a thing or, or help you get into an innovative mode mm -hmm. and you created some new technology. And so that that's why they were, they were saying when COVID happened and all this new innovation started to happen, it actually sped up the innovation, you know, cycle. And so yeah. this, this idea about, uh, the average bike wealth going to zero by originally, I think they said like uh, 2055. And then they said, well, based on what happened with, happening with COVID, it's probably going to happen 10 to 15 year, years sooner. And, and so, uh, because that's what, that's what, you know, challenges do. But the, so you, you said you, you know, you majored in uh, AI at Carnegie Mellon and you, you know, once, once people start learning stuff from AI, it's going to help them be even more innovative, you know, <laughs> and yeah. so accelerate innovation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, so, and, and this is one thing that I need to say out loud. Yes. Because this, this is just me speaking to me like yeah. five years ago, right? Yeah. Um, it's way easier to think when you have a little bit of money in the bank. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You have that time where you're not saying, you know, like one of the lowest points of my life was having uh, one of my sons tell me that he was hungry and I didn't know where I was going to get food from. Right. Yeah. Um, so not having that on my mind mm -hmm. really just gave me the privilege to just like sit and think. Yes. Right. And and that's one of the reasons why I, I feel like we do have a lot of like the, the villains got the dice rigged. Right. <laughs> it's like. Why are you not able to come up with these ideas? Why are you not willing, uh, able to innovate? And mm -hmm. it's just one of those things where, like, I don't have time to think. Like, yeah. I have to survive. Yes. So, I mean, um, I'll, I'll I'll leave his name out of it because he he definitely he gets a lot of heat for for saying things like this. But mm -hmm. even you know, we we're talking about like why black people, a lot of black tech people. Mm -hmm. don't become entrepreneurs is because we provide for our families and yeah. our extended families. So as soon as we stop making money, everybody crumbles. Like, I mean, not a yeah. lot of people know this, but like my, my parents, their house was foreclosed on. Mm -hmm. I could not, like, I could not pay it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So what do we do? So, I mean, it, it's, it's just one of those things where we're, we're playing two different games. Yeah. We're playing two different games right now. And, um, you know, until we figure out a, a, a good way to make, you know, success stories like people actually making money to invest back into the, the black community so that we can make those mistakes that you were saying in that video, right? Where we're allowed to make those mistakes, yeah. mm -hmm. allowed to think. We have so many more success stories, like just down the list. Yeah, and 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 so the, the um, so that that's kind of part of what the the this idea of you know inter, introducing more people to being a founder and and teaching them the best practices because that's going to be one of the major ways that is one of the major ways to build wealth you know uh, for your yeah. family and and, and the generations uh, um, to to come you know so. That that's uh, yeah, that's that's pretty pretty neat. So the so er, so so you talked a little bit about your journey. So like so meter feeder, you so you what did your what was your initial thing that you were trying to do with meter feeder when you first got got started? It was an app to pay for parking. Yeah, just just right? just to pay for yeah. parking. And, yeah, so. and, uh, and and so who who were you? Who were you targeting as the paying customers at, the, at, that, at that time? Yeah, so I mean, the paying customers was just going to be the people who were okay. right. Okay, um, but the thing is, um, 
you know, I didn't know anything. Okay. Right? I didn't know what B2B was. Like, what mm -hmm. is that? Right. So like people talk about SaaS models and all that stuff. Yeah. I was just a software developer who knew how to build things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you were saying a couple months for an MVP. My co-founder and I, we entered a hackathon. We were done mm -hmm. with our MVP over the weekend. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, we just knocked something out and went door to door and tried to sell it. Gotcha. And gotcha. Actually, you know, like now we're, we're far enough removed where I can sort of tell the stories, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, we sold the, the first municipality. They were like, cool, we have a way to pay for parking with, with a mobile phone. Amazing. Mm -hmm. We still use handwritten tickets. How do we tell when somebody paid digitally? We're like, you use our parking enforcement software, of course. We'll show it to you on our next meeting on Monday. We went home <laughs> and we wrote it so quick. <laughs> yeah. That, and yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, we just listened to, you know, oh, we had a very big oversight. And we w went and we wrote it. And we actually, that was one of the things I was saying that, like, we did mm -hmm. that to scale. We walked around with the parking enforcement officer. Yeah. And we just sat there and wrote tickets with them for like weeks mm -hmm. <laughs> so that we were able to see, you know, we were able to make a product that they actually wanted to use. Okay. Gotcha. 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 Yeah. So, um, so that, you know, relationship with the customer, I mean, so it, it actually sounds like it paid dividends for, for you all and helping you come up with problems that needed, needed to be solved. And so, 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 what you just said about you know doing a hackathon and and overnight over the weekend coming up with the MVP, that's fa fantastic. And so and so I kind of what I want to kind of kind of spin off that is is um, the the fact that you know it sounds like in your case you had a um, uh, relationship with someone and you both I guess I'm assuming were, are technical. Uh, like, Both of those are technical, yeah. Yeah, and so you have the skills to actually build whatever you're going, going to do. So what what the what the the lean stack methodology says if you're not a technical co-founder, if if you can pitch that business model you design clearly and concisely on how you make money, you can actually attract a technical co-founder to kind of to to be able to build stuff. But if, if you're trying to get a technical co-founder and, you, and you're not making it clear how you're going to make money, they're not going to be all of a sudden ready to come over and, and, yeah. and, and work for equity. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I would, I would also say, you know, because I, I've seen so many people fight over like one to two percent over wow. like, you know, like, oh, it's it's our third day. of uh, It's our third week as a company, right? Like, no, it's the third week as a company. They're a co-founder. Like, give them a chunk of the company. Like, it should be a double digit, like a healthy double digit number. Mm -hmm. right? if, if you're really trying to, you know, make your, your technical co-founder feel important. Yeah. Um, and, so and, 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 and just so the audience know, you actually um, you, you, and you Best practices are you you give them that that equity, but they that they get that equity over time. Best know? thing, yes, yeah, <laughs> best thing. <laughs> yes, yeah. So that that's um, so yeah, there, that's a definitely uh, a, a, a good nugget because that's always a question founders have is how do you split up split up the the equity um, equity there? So like. Um, we were talking about white combinator earlier and like like we're saying they're kind of like the open sourcing on how to be a founder and all that good stuff but um so um what do you think um major application the white combinator um look good to get in get in their program so I'm going to say this, and again, this is mm -hmm. probably not going to work. Okay. Right. <laughs> All right, in your case, I'm not, I'm not saying it's the, the every every case, but in your case, and, yeah, yeah. What do you, what do you think? So, okay, so thing number one, especially back then, uh, they were looking for builders, 
right? Yes. So if you're building it, you're and you're saying, you know, you're not showing showing excuses of why you're not doing something, right? Mm -hmm. Apparently, that's what they were looking for. Right? Mm -hmm. And I showed time and time again where I'm just ignoring <laughs> what all the naysayers are saying, and I'm working towards the goal, right? Yes. But the point, you know, the the person, the guy that was working the front desk, mm -hmm. he was like, he's going to get in. And the way that he knew that I was going to get in was because I stopped and I said hello. And I spoke to him like he was a human being. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? I even remember the, some of the jokes that I was saying. It's like he was going through. He knew exactly what to say. I was like, huh, first time he said that today, huh? <laughs> he was like, yeah. I was like, I don't know. You stuck at this desk. You want me to like get you a glass of water or something? <laughs> okay. And he was like, thank you, but no, right? So, I mean, that just just treating him like a human being, like uh, Jessica Livingston. She's one of the founders of, of uh, Y Combinator. Uh -huh. Perfect example, right? It's like she is literally one of the most powerful people on this planet. Not one of the most powerful women. Mm -hmm. One of the most powerful people, and people they didn't know who she was. They'd be like, "Excuse me, can you go get me a glass of water?" Right? Oh wow! Well. <laughs> and people would be like, "Like she would be like, they don't get in," <laughs> and they would be like, "Yes, Jessica," and that was it. Right? So I mean, I just didn't know, and I was just treating people like I wanted to be treated. And yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's definitely a good good trade. I want to remind the audience um, um, we're open to whatever questions you have. Um, if, if it's something about your startup or, or whatever, if it's something for Jim and and you know what he's doing with his startup, feel free to to um, to, to to chime in. So just um, from what I've learned from the. Uh, startup school um, and listening to some of the founders of Y Combinator. They, they, so I, I can tell you what my guess is, you know, um, and what I've, I've seen is, is like, it, it doesn't, like you and your co-founder, you, you both know how to build stuff. Yep. And, and you've been working, to, working together, good relationships. And, and so, it doesn't matter what you're building. It's, it's the fact that you all been working together and you all, you all get along. And yeah. so that's one of the one of the, your team is, is one of the biggest factors. And I actually have a slide and I didn't put it in my thing here. Yeah. On, you know, on some of the reason why some founders or startups are successful and some not. Yeah. But, I mean, like mm -hmm. I'll put it to you this way. And, mm -hmm. and this is way, way oversimplification. Yes. Yeah. So just take that with a grain of salt. It's really hard. It's very hard to get mad at someone who's trying mm -hmm. to make you obnoxiously wealthy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to stay mad at them, right? Like if they're like, I can tell him something and be completely mm -hmm. honest with him because he knows yeah. I'm out there trying to make him obnoxiously wealthy and vice versa. Yeah. Right. So yeah. even if we, we don't agree on something, it's like, you know, someone's just going to be like, well, I trust you go. Mm -hmm. If this doesn't work, you're going to, you're going to hear, you'll, you'll see it in the Christmas cards for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was actually just listening to uh, an article about just what you're talking about. Um, you know, you know, um, understanding each other and being emotionally intelligent enough to, you know, um, you know, it's okay to disagree, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like you, you need to have the, the hard conversations. There's actually a book called the uh, five dysfunctions of a team. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Five Ooh. dysfunctions of a team. I, I haven't <laughs> heard, about, heard about that one. <laughs> yeah. That, that really, uh, uh, stabbed me in the heart because I was the tech guy. Right. And mm -hmm. they were like, you know, and it's written in a, like a nonfiction sort of situation. So like the mm -hmm. tech guy walks in and he's like, ah, oh, you know, he sits down at the meeting and he opens up his laptop and he starts typing and starts, you know, and it's like, uh, you're supposed to be part of this meeting. Well, you try to get this, you want me to get this code done or not? Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, it, it was just one of those things where I had to, 
sit down and, and really learn and understand. Okay. Okay. We've got a couple of questions here. <laughs> a co-founder story. This is one of the... <laughs> so um, back in the day, uh, before AWS and all that stuff, there was uh, companies, what they would do is they would buy a bunch of servers and run Cat5 to the office and, you know, they would host websites, right? Um, so I actually went to one of these uh, these places and I just asked them for office space. Mm -hmm. My co-founder was in the cubicle next to me. <laughs> uh, one day, it was funny because they, um, it, it's one of those things where I kind of hope that they, they see the story. You know, we, we've semi kept in com, com, in contact. So okay. uh, one day they showed up and I mean, they're not paying him anywhere near what he's worth. Uh, wow. I built software for him. They're just not paying me, right? So like they walked up to him and me like individually and they were like sorry we can't really pay you uh uh this this month like we're, we're running late we're running low on bills right this man pulls out a wad of hundreds and says here's a hundred dollars <laughs> you gotta be kidding like, me here i'm giving you what i can right a wad of hundreds and he's giving you one of them and he was like i realize this looks bad i was like okay whatever right it's like I'm here. I have heat. I'm. I'll. I'll have money for food for a while, right? Just as long as you give me the money before you know this hundred dollars is gone. It's not like I was like living like a king, right? Mm -hmm. I literally. I. I had a cot next to my bed, uh, next to my desk. So mm -hmm. when I was done writing software, I could literally go lay down, mm -hmm. and look back up, and get back to work. The next day literally the next day not like the next day literally the next day the two founders pull up in bmws you gotta be kidding <laughs> so yeah we 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 left that day and we were like okay <laughs> we're, we're building new stuff we actually found an office literally across the street <laughs> okay it started working out of there so yeah wow. that was that was our co-founder our co-founder story okay fantastic fantastic <laughs> So, but is that that's when you first met him when you went to look for that office space? No, no, I I met him like when I first, uh, well, that first office space with the server company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. that's where we met. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah, that's 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 pretty 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 neat. Uh, so so the uh, the what I we um, you know I, I guess you you and I met through Cameron. Uh, and with blacks and technology and and so we were you know i was chatting when i was chatting with you back then the you know we we did this little conversation about founder oppor opportunities and taking advantage of founders opportunities um so would you kind of share some some of your opportunity stories i mean what level of founder opportunities <laughs> Yeah. So, like, so you, so, cause I think you, I think you told me that when you all got started, you all were, um, you know, doing right space or something. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was the hackathon, right? Okay. So like, yeah. So we, we entered the hackathon, 300 people entered and we ended up winning, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's, that was essentially our opportunity. We ended up winning $10,000. Okay. Um, I have a wife and five sons. So, needless mm -hmm. to say, I need to keep my day job. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that was, that was not quite the founder opportunity. It was, you know, uh, it was, yeah. well, it, it was, it was, it was, yeah. But and what the point well said, and that's what a lot of founders think they, when they're in this idea stage, they, and, and don't have a product out there yet, they think they need to quit the job and you don't need to quit, quit your job. You know, you, you wait till you get some serious traction, but right. the, the, the point is, is when, when you all started hosting you all software, you all were paying to have it host. And then I thought you said something about you in the taking advantage of some opportunity. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that was, so the funny thing with that is, um, you know, they at the time were startup focused. Okay. They were trying to 
you know, show off some of their, their technology. And we yeah. were using all of their technology. I was like, you know, I'm, yes, I'm the CEO. However, I am uh, certified in MongoDB. Okay. <laughs> and they were trying to like, oh, look at our MongoDB stuff and, you know, stuff like that. So we use like every single thing and just talked about it. And, you know, they were like, okay, here's the poster child of what we need, like, of, of what we want to show. Right. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they ended up putting money behind, you know, promoting us. Okay. Because all we were doing was promoting their capabilities. Gotcha. Right? And, um, you know, I like to call that buying people before they walk in the room. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. So they're essentially forced to help us because we're a perfect commercial for their services. Yes, gotcha. And gotcha. then they were bought by a private equity firm who like squeezed them for all of the juice that was left in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, it was, but I think you said you all eventually started using um, Google Cloud Platform. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because uh, you know, Rackspace was known for, uh, uh, oh man, how do they put it? Fanatical service. Mm -hmm. They were fanatics. They were fanatical service. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, when they got to the point where they were just like. You might want to find another cloud provider. We're like, <laughs> okay, okay, we will find another cloud provider. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, it just so happens that uh, we were also part of uh, Google Black Founders Fund. And okay, so 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 yeah, I forgot about that. So the so the but I guess the point I was trying to lead to with the opportunity, you ended up getting some cloud credits with Google. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we got. And, and I was part of being part of the Black Founders Fund, right? So not okay. only did they uh, give us some cloud credits, but they actually gave us like some real life U.S. dollar credits too. So okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, and so that's that's kind of what I what I mean when I talk about our, our opportunities. So like so, um, typically, you know, with Black Founders, they they um, do either fifty or hundred k. And, and how many cloud credits they they, they, they give you all? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was a hundred thousand. Yeah, so a hundred thousand. So how how what impact that did that have on your your bottom bottom line? It was that over two years or one year or what? Uh, I want to say it was one year. Okay, um, two years. It was two years. Yeah, because yeah. they started it's typically two years. Yeah, it's typically two years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, like on our bottom line, it's like. Honestly, like all of our stuff is like as streamlined as possible. So it's yes. like we weren't burning a lot. Mm -hmm. But what it did do, you know, because since we're, you know, getting all of this data from, from vehicles, we were yeah. like, oh, let me build this model that, you know, can predict parking availability and, and things yeah. along those lines, right? So yeah, yeah, it, it enabled us to like increase our R&D budget um, okay. so that we can stay on the cutting edge right yeah. so when all the other big companies are like this is what we're doing we're like no you're not <laughs> because <laughs> i know the actual real answer right so uh it, it helped us stay a little bit further ahead of the curve yeah and so but so you you said you you got that opportunity through um google black um founders program so how how did you get into that program what was the story you know, on that, whether what was that, what connections you had that helped you get in that program? So you remember, uh, I was telling you about, I don't like startup competitions, uh, yeah. or pitch competitions. Mm -hmm. And I told you that there was this one time where I was really like over the moon that I lost the pitch competition. Mm -hmm. That person was previous year, Black Founders Fund. And she was like, you need to talk to Jim Gibbs. Okay. That's how we got into the Black Founders Fund. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so like um so so the person that won? Yeah, yeah. They yeah. talked to the people that were running the, the Google for Black Founders. Yeah. And they, they, yeah. they recommended your 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 startup? Yeah, yeah. Sonia Ebron from Courtroom Five. Okay. Uh, courtroom five. Like they they're trying to keep black people out of jail. Obviously they're <laughs> trying to help with parking. And yeah. you want me to try to win a parking competition, a, a, a pitch competition? No, like yeah. hers is way more important. 
You got you, got you, got you. Yeah. So yeah, like we essentially became friends. Like her, her smile is like a warm hug, right? So mm-hmm. uh, I, I think she, she's an amazing person, and yeah. um, you know, uh, I guess. So how, how is mutual? So we're, we're this pitch competition you are were in. So was that a part of another program or you all just did y'all just meet at the pitch competition or, or what? Yeah, that was uh, American Underground uh, has a Google for startups um, program. Right? Yes. So, uh, you know, I honestly, you know, like after Y Combinator, you know, we were our first investor asked us if we could live like cockroaches and clearly we can. Right, because mm-hmm. we live in Pittsburgh, we don't live in Silicon Valley, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like way easier for me to like live off of less dollars. Yeah. Um, so then I realized that I was also comparing myself to a lot of my white counterparts, and that was not a good thing, right? So, what, it's so, like, what, oh, so, so what? So what does that mean when you say you're comparing to white counterparts? So when. When I walk into a room and I tell someone that I built medical software, you know, they might believe me, they might not believe me. Okay. Chances are they're not going to believe me. Gotcha, gotcha. My tall, redhead, white co founder, mm-hmm. if he walks in the room, he's like, hey, I built, he was literally sitting right next to me. Okay. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. But they'll believe him. Yeah. Right? So it was one of those hard parts where it's like I had to really try to get people to start believing me. And, yeah. um, you know, they would believe everybody else, but they wouldn't believe me. And right. that's where one of the things that I really just had to come to grips with. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when I came to the realization, stop just, you know, barking up the tree that's ch- telling me no. Mm-hmm. I was like, OK, well, let me try to find people that say yes. Right. Okay. And then, you know, the like that's when we found uh Google for Startups and um, you know, American Underground. And yeah. that's when we, we started following that path. And right. one of the things that I found was the more people that met me, like I'd be surrounded by people who believed me. And it was like that believing started to spread. Gotcha. Right? So the people who didn't believe me before are started to be like, oh yeah, well. That's Jim Gibbs. I was wrong. I should believe him from the beginning, right? And <laughs> that's that's essentially uh, uh, the the the. If there's one thing that I would say, like if you remember anything from this talk, just find the people who believe in you. Yes. And just like keep executing, and yes. show them like they're smart for believing you. Yeah, that that's really that's really good good thing. I, I want to mention one other thing and then I want to follow up on that. So this underground program, is that the one in North Carolina? Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. So so kind of like what the what the playbook is, because you know, we've met a couple other founders and 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 they went through that same journey to to get the Google for, for black founders. So like you so and that's based on that underground program has that relationship with um, you know, um, Google for startups and the black founder program. So that's that's a pretty neat deal. So, like, so what I think the one of the things is 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 um, and also you mentioned the referral stuff as well. And so the I'm, I'm thinking for the founders out there, you know, you, you need to look at that particular program and say what does it take to get in that program because it's the direct connection to that you know fifty or hundred thousand dollar paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so that's that's kind of what 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 I wanted to 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 um to to say about that because you do get into programs you know based on based on the the, the referrals, referrals. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. As as much as we don't want referrals, like uh, 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 Dell is like ban warm leads. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. So, but so- I got kids to feed. <laughs> Like so, so I'm glad you mentioned. You know, you know, stop trying to sell people. You know that, you know that not going to believe you. Go to the people that will believe you. And so, I, what I want to say clearly as possible, and you know, so I think um, after George Floyd, 
a lot of these big companies, they, they realize that their employees, these venture capital, they realize that their employees, white employees, are not going to believe these black founders. So what they said was, you know, we're going to set aside some funding just for black founders because we know these, we, this bias that these folks have, they're, they're not going to listen to the black founders. So we need to set aside some money just for black, black founders. And what, yeah. and, and so, so what, one of the reasons why we, st you know, started start up on the blocks was the, this money just started adding up. Mm -hmm. And and I would think over over the years since George Floyd, it, it it went from two or three billion to over like fifty billion when they started when COVID came and they started including, um, you know, Main Street businesses, and 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 so I'm saying, how can our black founders down here in Northwest Florida, you know, get some of this money? Yeah, and did you get any? No. Well, see, that's what that's what. <laughs> If you don't, if you don't know how to pitch what you're doing or communicate to these investors, you're never going to get any of the money. I didn't. I know how to pitch. I didn't get any of that money. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, but, but but see that. But see the deal is, you, what you might not realize is, I don't know how many. I know Google started off with a hundred million. I don't know how much more they started off. You know, but they did target. That's where those programs came for black founders. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah that's it was, it was, it was just one of those things where, you know, everybody was talking about, oh, we're going to help the black people. We're going to help the black mm -hmm. people. And it's like, you know, part of me was like, I, it, it was almost like I was doing myself a disservice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's like they wanted to help black people. And when you're like, hey, here's this guy who's been writing software for almost 40 years and has built a whole bunch of things that I use, mm -hmm. right? His how product can you not, is, can you is, not believe is growing like that. Yeah. yeah. They're like, well, we can help them. We mm -hmm. can help them. And they can't help me because yeah. it's not the story of like savior coming in. And, yeah. You know, I'm like, yeah. look, I will sing your, I, I will make sure that everybody knows that you invest in black founders. Right. And that will, that will help your, you know, like if you're trying to wash away your sins, yeah. right. Like investing in a good company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, sure, I'll take it. But it's like, you know, it, the, the narrative was wrong, right? Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't as depressed, right? I, I, I came from a loving household and mm -hmm. I built another loving household. So I don't have any really good stories for you, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. if you're trying to invest in black folks, here we are, but yeah. we, we look different. We act different. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're all different people. We're actually unique people, individuals, yeah. we're not a monolith. Right. So, yes. Um, yes. I, I really do think that uh, there was a lot of missed opportunity with that money. And yeah, I, I would you agree 100 percent. And yeah. And yeah. But <clears throat> from <clears throat> my experience, you know, being a startup founder, you know, it's it's, you know, so this is just my experience, period. You know, if you're trying to do something, what are the resources out there that are to help you? Period. Right. And it, it's literally that 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 simple. And then mm -hmm. so like you, you say you and, and what I this is what I this is what I really tell tell people when it comes to the startup stuff. I said the minute you start working on your idea, whatever idea, you know, and, it's, and you're trying to do something that's scalable, you are a founder. And the minute you become a founder, you can start asking for help. And, yes. Yes. and, and that and that's what the deal is. And I always tell the story, you know. I worked in a research laboratory. You know, we came up with an idea. We had to go out and find funding for that idea. We came up, you know, like once we sort of validated the idea a little bit, then we um, had to do go ask for more funding to take it further. And then we had to ask for more funding to build a prototype or the MVP and so on and so forth. And that that's that's the way the startup founder journey is. And but most a lot of folks are brainwashed that you know. You know, you have to go get a loan in order to to do your business stuff. And but you know, this this startup stuff, it's it's a it's really the the golden ticket for a lot of black folks. Yeah, but I mean, uh, like, admittedly, and, and this, mm -hmm. this is something needs to be said, right? Like, yeah, you and me are are are. I know very few people like you, Lloyd. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, I like. 
reading your resume, you are a very unique and amazing individual, mm -hmm. right? So for you to be able to go out and like raise, you know, a couple bucks, like that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I hope to one day have a resume that looks anywhere near, like, I just can't do it at this point in my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like even me, you know, my, my resume is pretty significant and pretty substantial. So it's like, I feel as though it's my job to, you know, like, look, I got all this hair, right? It's like uh, the Rastafarian comes walking in the door, like, look at this rag above mm -hmm. I want the investors to look at the next six foot four black man with a whole, with yeah. too, way too much hair, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And just look at them like they're serious. And I feel as though like that's that's kind of the job that that, that we need to take and well, just to be good stewards, just so that yeah. people can believe the next generation. Yeah. So, so needless to say, you know, everything you were talking about with your experience, that's I experienced my whole, whole career, you know, as a black person in technology and in the research lab. And, and so, you know, you just have to come up with strategies to get around the foolishness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that the God gave you a brain to be created. So you have to kind of. You use it, but I guess we're we're about out of time here, and we, I just want folks in the audience to know that we appreciate you uh, listening, and, and Jim, we appreciate you coming in to share some stories, and yeah, I, I definitely, um, you know, you brought up some really really key things. Any any um, takeaway things you want to leave with the with the folks? Sure, um, pitching people, I I want to make sure that. Uh, you realize a lot of people that you pitch are dumb. They don't know what you're talking about, myself included, right? I don't know what you're talking about. Like whatever you're working on, I don't know. You're way smarter than I am. Mm -hmm. uh, so use small words, uh, mm -hmm. preferably like no more than three sentences. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, actually I'll, I'll even say it. So my email address is jim at meterfeeder.com. Literally first sentence, hey, saw you on startup on the blocks you said send me an email with a question here's my question thanks right if you send me that if you send me five paragraphs not gonna read it archived yeah <laughs> right? mm -hmm. if i have to think super hard about it i'll get back to you by the end of the week but yeah. if it's like a simple question like hey you know like this is what i'm looking for uh and you said i should look into this I'll just respond, right? And it's like you'll see that a lot of people, you know, will respond to to something like that, and that goes right back to what you're talking about as far as the pitching is concerned, right? So, yeah. you know, if you're able to get it into like one to two sentences, that's where you want to be. Great, great. That's that's fantastic. So, uh, uh, thanks for coming, and everybody out there. We'll see you all next week, and we really are. Uh, appreciate uh, everything. Thanks a lot, Jim. All right. Thank you.